uh, welcome to the 17th MedResults Network Educational Webinar. I'm Jamie Parrott, President of MedResults Network, and as always, I want to thank everyone for taking time uh, out of your afternoon to attend this presentation. I'm delighted to announce that by next month, we'll have held 18 free educational webinars in the last year, and the best part is that we're going to continue to add uh, new additional educational webinars as we move into 2016. Since we began our series in November last year, we've been doing our best to bring you both product and service education so that you can successfully sell the products and services you offer and increase your revenue in the long run. And, and this is in addition to the discounts and rebates the network offers, which should already be adding to your bottom line. As we have a lot to cover today, I'm going to keep my comments short so that we can get straight to the presentation. Everyone who's in attendance should know that this presentation isn't going to be distributed as a recording like we normally do. So this is a very special and exclusive event for MedResults Network members. Uh, with that said, I'd like to introduce you all to our guest speaker, Dr. Dr. Cheryl Burgess. And Dr. Burgess is a board-certified dermatologist and the founder of the Center for Dermatology and Dermatologic Surgery in Washington, D.C. Currently, she also serves as the president of the practice and she is a key opinion leader, an advisor, a consultant, and a clinical investigator for uh, MERS Aesthetics, Kythera, Allergan, Johnson & Johnson, Valiant, uh, and Biocosmetic Research Labs. And she's often consulted as a medical ex expert. Um, she's even being, been featured on NBC News, Fox News, and ABC News. So she joins us today to introduce us to one of the most talked about topics in 2016, which is the addition of Radius's new indication for hand treatment. Uh, before Dr. Burgess begins, I want to share two reminders. At the end of her presentation, don't tune out just too quickly. Um, I've included a final slide which will show you how you can become a certified injector of Radius for hands. And if you want to be recognized and receive marketing support from MERS Aesthetics as a certified Radius for hands injector, you must complete their training. So I encourage you to stay on through the length of the presentation. And finally, after we finish the presentation, a brief survey is going to pop up with a few questions about the topic today. If you have questions for Dr. Burgess or for me, please use the survey to ask your questions or just simply let us know that you're interested in receiving additional information. And with all that said, I'd like to introduce you to our very special guest, Dr. Cheryl Burgess. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me in the midday. I'm in Washington, D.C., so it's around 2 o'clock. And I finished my day, and I have some exciting news to tell you about a recent uh, FDA-cleared technique of using radius in the hands, on the dorsum of the hands. So I need to advance this. Uh, Jamie, can you advance it for me, or? Yeah, let me. Uh, I, I, I will uh, click again to give you the the controls. There you go. You should be able to, to click through it now. Uh, okay, it's not working. If, are, you, are you clicking it? Or, or using your, uh, there you go. It's working over here. Oh, there it is. It's just a little slow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, the objective today, we want to introduce the new indication for radius for hands. And it's the first and only dermal filler that has been FDA cleared for the correction of hand volume loss. So that's when you kind of see the tendons and the, the accentuation of the veins in the hands. And it, the results are immediate and can last up to a year. So we want to demonstrate the effectiveness and the ideal use for radius for the hands um, volume loss, and most people are probably familiar with Radius because it has been out since the early 2000s in use for aesthetic filler, dermal filler in the face. So I got to get used to doing this. Very slow. Okay, so we're going to talk about the aesthetic needs today um, for the primarily the hands, and we'll look at the unique properties of radius, the clinical evidence for radius for the hands. So we'll look at some of the clinical trials, some before and after pictures, the injection technique and best practices and how to use this in your 
practice and incorporating radius for hands in your practice and some closing remarks and questions and information about where to get training. Okay, so what is radius approved for? There are really three um, indications that, that the FDA has cleared this particular dermal filler for. So it's used in subdermal implantation for correction of moderate to severe wrinkles and folds, such as the nasolabial fold. Um, it was also uh, cleared for HIV facial lipoatrophy and those with HIV and AIDS. And then lastly, for the correction of volume loss in the back of the hands. So first, because this is a company-sponsored webinar, I need to go over the safety information. And it's not uncommon for me to do this, particularly even when I'm working with my residents, because I feel that they need to know all the adverse events and things that could possibly happen in using this preparation so that you are prepared. So the indication, again, we just, dis just discussed that. And there's some important safety information, particularly um, contraindicated in patients who have severe allergies, such as some people can have anaphylaxis, bleeding disorders. We also need to um, assess patients who are on preparations that actually can increase their bleeding and thus bruising, and hypersensitivity to lidocaine. So there's some specific warnings that are, are um, common with most fillers, and this is recent that the FDA has put out a monograph of filler safety amongst all the fillers. And basically it's saying the same thing, that if injected improperly, you could have embolization, occlusion of a vessel, ischemia, and infarction, so that um, it's, it's definitely training is very important in using these preparations, particularly in the face. So also, you can have um, temporary or permanent vision impairment, blindness, cerebral ischemia, or a cerebral hemorrhage, hemorrhage, which has been seen more common in all the fillers lately. And there have been a lot of reports in that it can be even at a distal site, and you can have it migrate to the um, ocular arteries and arterioles and cause a temporary or permanent blindness. You can also occlude a vessel and cause necrosis of the skin and damage to the underlying facial structures. One thing that we know that we want to make sure we don't inject in areas of active skin inflammation or infection. The next area talks about the effects in, as far as injection in the lips. It has not been established that this is suitable for injecting in the lips, so we ask our injectors to avoid that. Also avoid injection into veins or tendons when injecting into the hand. And there can be um, temporary difficulty in performing activities at least it was reported in 48% of the study patients. And we also saw nodules, bumps, and lumps in the dorsum of the hands, and about 12% reported this. And it can last up to a year. And we'll go through information about what to do about these nodules if they ever occur to you. But there was some significant in its association with some of the darker or richly pigmented skin types, particularly Fitzpatrick skin type 4 through 6. So also the safety information, and this goes back to how the study was, um, the protocol was set up in that they felt that more than um, need be, that training is very, very important for everyone, and the volume as well. And so the three cc's of radius per hand, so that would be two syringe fulls of the 1.5 cc's 
per anything over and beyond that has not been established. So it's very important that people um, adhere to these indications right now. Um, of course, the volume is, what you'll see in the study, a little bit higher than what I'm stating here, and that's because the increased volume and in calculation of how much you dilute it with um, lidocaine. So radius is the one that is FDA clear for hands and not radius. So again, the established um, injection in lips, that has not been established, so um, be aware of that. So precautions, potential complications is always important and it should be used by healthcare professionals who have appropriate training and experience in those who are knowledgeable about the anatomy at and around the injection site. So again, wait to the end to definitely get the information and where you can be trained to use this preparation. So some safety and efficacy issues that we need to address, and that is where it's safe to use this product and where it may be of concern and where there's not enough data to um, encourage injection in patients with diseases, injuries, or disabilities of the hand. Um, beyond three years in the space and one year in the hand, uh, in the periorbital area, of course, we talked about blindness as well, so that is a major concern. Uh, interactions between radius or radius plus with drugs or other substances or implants. Use of pregnancy or breastfeeding women in the dorsum of the hand of patients under 26 years old or over 79 years old, and that is because the study was limited to those over 26 and younger than 79 years old. Um, placed in the face of patients under 18 years old, again, the studies only enrolled patients over 18 years old. In patients who increase susceptibility to keloid formation or hypertrophic scar, again, in all of the studies, patients who had a history of scar formation were excluded from the study. And we could comment it, dermal therapies such as epilation, UV radiation, or laser mechanical or chemical peeling procedures. Okay, Jamie, can you push it back? I think I clicked it too long for the next slide. I, I just pushed it back. Did you get it over there? Okay, yes, I see it. Okay. okay. So the other thing is that calcium hydroxyl apatite is very radio opaque and it can be seen visibly on CT scans and so when you go for these types of diagnostic exams, they may be questionable areas that you may need to inform the person who is doing the test. And it's also injection carries a risk of infection anytime you pierce the skin. Of course, we recommend thorough cleansing of the skin before any of these products are injected. And there is unknown information about those with autoimmune disease affecting um, the hands or the hand implants or any kind of contractures, tumors, vascular malformations, et cetera. Um, we don't know how it would react in these patients because they were excluded from the study. There can be significant swelling with this product on the dorsum of the hand. So we will go through um, a little videotape as far as looking at what you do in the post-procedure um, uh, routine for the hands and instructions to the patient. Patients using medications such as aspirin or warfarin, uh, they will be 
need to be instructed that they could have increased bruising and bleeding at the injection site, and therefore bruises can last anywhere from 10 to 14 days, so patients need to be aware of that. Any history of previous herpetic eruptions can be reactivated by any type of procedure, not just injectables, and it should they should minimize strenuous activity and exposure in the area, sun, heat, within 24 hours of getting the treatment or until any of the swelling or redness has resolved. So with, okay, can you um, push it back a little bit? One slide back. Okay, so adverse Reactions, again, include necrosis, allergic reaction, edema, and infection. The hand can become bruised from the procedure, redness, swelling, pain, itching nodules or bumps, lumps, difficulty performing activities, loss of sensation, and other local side effects. So these are some things that need to be discussed with the patient and to report any problems you can call the 866 number, customer service, for RADIUS or RADIUS Plus. So going to the next slide, when we're addressing volume loss from the face to the hands, we know that as we age, we experience a whole host of things happening. And one thing that's missing on here is gravity, but collagen, elastin, fat volume loss, and bony prominence or actually shrinking of the bone when you're dealing with the face, we can see evidence of this. And the effects that you see as a result of this, these physiological things happening is you can see etched in lines, wrinkles, folds, and laxity. So like the face, the hands lose volume over time. And so we know that People can do a lot to improve um, the cosmetic enhancement of the face, but sometimes up until now we have had to neglect our hands because there wasn't a suitable preparation for hands until just recently with the FDA clearance of radius. During the course of the approval, the studies had to be conducted and therefore a MERS hand grading scale was necessary for the FDA to establish that there was significant improvement with the use of this dermal product. And as you can see, with no loss of fatty tissue is a zero, and it was graded all the way to four, where there's very severe loss of fatty tissue, marked visible veins and tendons in the backs of the hands. So this was a grading scale that, one, um, included patients into the study and excluded others and their response to treatment. So because in the recent years there's been a lot of attention to the aesthetic appearance of the hands, <clears throat> you can see that in a lot of uh, newspapers and publications, although all these women are very beautiful in their faces, when their hands were next to their face, they got a lot of bad reviews in that it actually was uh, the trademark of a Madonna to wear gloves for a while. And, and so the first photographer that caught her without the gloves made a, a comment about her hands were not as youthful as her face. So we see this all the time with a lot of the critics. And, and of course, women for years have wanted to know what to do for the hands until now we have something available. So it's the first dermal filler that is FDA approved for outside use outside of the face, including the indication for correction of hand volume loss. And it's treating the hands with radius that enhances the overall appearance and provides the opportunity to finally match our hands to the investment we've made in our faces. While the face is probably the number one indicator of age, hands are second, definitely. And Radius for Hands has allowed us to broaden our line of injectables 
for even more complete aesthetic regimen. So now we're going to look at the unique properties of radius. Those who are familiar with radius knows it's kind of white, opaque, almost looks like caulk, um, which is different from the other fillers. So a lot of people can identify it by just looking at the syringe. But we can restore volume loss and reduce the prominence of tendons and veins, helping to provide an improved appearance of the hands. So it's soft, it's moldable, and it's really a gel consistency. And the calcium hydroxyl appetite spheres or the microspheres in the preparation stimulates the body to produce its own collagen. So even after the body has absorbed the filler, the benefits of new natural collagen remain behind. So the composition is an aqueous gel carrier, which is 70% of the product. And as you can see, um, when we have an aqueous preparation, a lot of it is water, and we absorb that water. But the most important part of it is the calcium hydroxyl appetite, which is 30%. And they're little microspheres, roughly about 25 to 45 micrometers uh, in, in size, and they contain calcium and phosphorus ions, and we know that it's a natural component of teeth and bones, making it ideal for implant material. So looking at the skin integrity, what does it do once it's in the skin? Well, first let's look at young skin versus old skin. As you can see, in a young person, they have a lot of support that's there. This is fibroblast, collagen fibers, but as we, and, and more order to the skin. As we age, as you can see, there's a lot of disorder to the skin and that we want to uh, inject preparation that can actually bring back order. So the neocollagenesis is something that this product, Radius, is known for and that we do see even further results after the initial product has been absorbed by the body. So before radius, you may have a depression in the skin or destruction of the, the collagen, so you have a little bit of volume loss, uh, decreased elasticity and firmness of the skin. You inject or do the correction with calcium hydroxyl appetite and you see that it fills the lost volume almost immediately. Then you see a stimulation of the fibroblast to produce collagen. And then the uh, network starts to form and the aqueous gel carrier is naturally absorbed by the bottom by the body, and then the calcium hydroxyl appetite, it tends to disintegrate and is naturally metabolized by macrophages. And lastly, then we have stimulation of the patient's own collagen, which is left behind. So it gives more support and facilitates long-lasting effects of radius. So looking at electron microscopy, you can actually see this process happening. So at 30 months post-implantation, you see the degradation of the calcium and the, and the phosphorus ions. And so this is a natural metabolic process that occurs in our body. Next, we're going to talk about the clinical trials that were done for radius of the hands. So this was a, a safety and efficacy study in looking at this specific calcium hydroxyl appetite dermal fillers for hand treatment. And Mitchell Goldman was the lead investigator in this study. So there were six different sites that um, enrolled 114 patients, and it was a multi-centered, uh, randomized, controlled, single-blind study of radius. And the patients were treated in the main study for three months with a follow-up period of 12 months post-enrollment. 
And so some patients were randomized. It was roughly about a three to one in that patients got radius um, in both hands. And then the control group did not receive any treatment in either hand. So as you can see, the multi-centered study design in that we started with, with uh, 114 patients. It was a three to one ratio, so roughly 85 people got the treatment and 29 did not. Looking at the three month period, um, the primary endpoint was could we tell um, who got the treatment and who didn't? Well, obviously we could because the control uh, arm of the study could now then get treatment um, with the radius. And so at six months, the primary group got an optional retreatment of the hands, and then six months after the start of the control group, then they were able to get an optional retreatment. So looking at them at four, I mean uh, 12, months, you can see that that was the final evaluation of all 114 patients. So each patient received up to two syringes, so three cc's per hand, mixed with 0.26 cc's of 2% lidocaine in the dorsum of the hand. A 27 gauge needle was used and a 1.5 cc syringe was used. So that's one of the standards, and it can also come in 0.8, but the 1.5 cc syringes were used. It was injected into the right and the left dorsum of the hands. It was injected between the first and the fifth metacarpal areas and started between um, the, the uh, second and fourth metacarpal. So the investigator had an option to inject 0.2 to 0.5 cc's or bolus, but they could not exceed 0.5 cc's per bolus. At the discretion of the injector, um, the results were achieved. Three cc's was the upper limit of product per hand that could be injected. So we were looking at the effectiveness in evaluating the change in the hand appearance from baseline and at follow-up visits. So using the MERS hands grading scale, or the MHGS, we looked at a live assessment performed by a trainer and a qualified math evaluator at each site. And then the patients looked at their global aesthetic improvement scale, which is GAIS. That was self-administered by the subjects, and they evaluated their outcomes. So looking at safety, all the patients had to record every adverse event, regardless if it was flu or cold, and they had a 30-day diary, and they had to bring the diary to the investigator with each subsequent visit, and looking at the side effects or the adverse events, and what type it was, duration, severity, and time of onset. So the safety was, was evaluated also in using real-time hand function. And with that, the patients were uh, given uh, different blocks and different hand maneuvers to see how well they could, um, their hands would function immediately after the injections and throughout the duration of the a study up to 12 months. So here you see the breakdown of the 114 subjects. Of course, majority of them were women. We have no problem in enrolling women in studies. They love the cosmetic studies. But what we see is naturally that women doesn't mean that men can be are not injected. We saw a per, uh, predominant 74 or greater than 72 percent Caucasians and. And we saw typically in a lot of studies, Fitzpatrick skin types two and three were the bulk of, of the patients that we saw. The mean age was 53.3 years. I think the oldest patient was in their 70s. So both treatment and control groups had a mean score of 2.6 on the MERS hand grading scale. So you see this box right here, that in anywhere between a 
classification of two, anywhere in between two to three, were qualified to enter the study if they fit all the inclusion criteria. Anyone who had a zero, one, or four were excluded for the, from the study. So the primary endpoint, remember, was like three months after they were injected, regardless if they were the initial group that injected or it was the control group that once at three months were found to have not seen any difference in their hands, they were allowed to be injected. And so they had more than a one-point improvement in their MHGS scale. So the MERS hand grading scale, they had to either go to a one or a zero in order to show efficacy and improvement in the study. The secondary endpoint, um, we're looking at the mean change from baseline, and as you can see in the patients, that that was significant as well. When they're looking at the patients who just received a single treatment, you can see that the patients typically did very well, um, up to 12 months. So 72% of the patients actually maintained their volumizing of the hands with a single treatment. Remember, it's six, three months after they could get, or six months after they could get an additional retreatment. But we found that a lot of patients who didn't get a retreatment still did well in the study. So this is looking at the sustained aesthetic improvement in that all the patients, even those who were retreated, and had a single treatment kind of fared the same. It wasn't significant in its in improvement. And as you can see here, the data for a single treatment is about 86% improvement at 12 months. So the adverse events that reported through the study generally were expected and mild to moderate. So the mean duration of the AEs was about eight days, and nearly all of them reported initial onset within two weeks after the treatment. And it was very common to see bruising, swelling, redness, and pain. Um, but seven patients experienced nodules. And further investigation into this significant um, patient population that got nodules seem to come from only one of the, uh, the, um, the clinical trial sites. So we, we don't know if there was a difference in the injection technique or volume that was used by that specific site, but none of the other sites had patients who developed nodules. So the investigator reported actions taken to treat the adverse events. 98% nothing was done. It wasn't required at all. Um, there were probably half a percent of patients who did have some type of adverse event that needed intervention. And I believe um, one patient had a broken leg and the other patient had a vasovagal reaction, but again, these were not uh, consistent with um, most of the patients who had experienced adverse events. And um, like we said, in clinical investigative trials, the patients are to report everything that happens to them. And we're looking over a year's time that they were enrolled in the study, and so they must report everything. Again, you look at the patients, 113 of the patients who reported the adverse events, say in their, their month-long diary, um, we had a lot of swelling. As you can see, 99.1% have swelling. So that's something that we can definitely tell our patients that's going to occur. And there are ways that we can minimize or, or eliminate some of the harsh swelling that patients may experience. 
And, and next we saw redness. Of course, when we use a lot of preparations and just entering the skin, we can see redness. And then thirdly, bruising. Of course, we're trying to um, look beyond the veins and not specifically inject into the veins, but sometimes they're inadvertently hit and bruising can occur. And then a lot of people experience pain. Um, and of course, injecting with a needle, you can experience pain, particularly in the area of the dorsum of the hand, which is sometimes really sensitive. So this is an example of the diary that the patients had to uh, complete. Day zero, they had to evaluate their left hand and their right hand, and all the, the foreseen uh, adverse events were listed there, but if there were some that weren't listed, the patient had the opportunity to uh, note that and discuss it with the clinical investigator. So looking at the adverse events over a 12-month period, Again, in 113 subjects, we see, again, um, the swelling, probably number one, and uh, pain and bruising and uh, the redness are, are, are at the top of the list. Now, the majority of the lumps and bumps and nodules were reported in the study were mild. Um, there was no intervention. This is a typical nodule in the back of the, uh, back of the hand. And one thing that we do see is that that's a common location that if a nodule is going to occur, it usually occurs between the second and third um, metacarpal area. Um, or the second metacarpal area. So that's a common area, and it may be due to the deep tendon that's in that area and where the preparation may, with too deep of an injection, it can get trapped under that tendon, and therefore um, you can see a nodule. So this example on 100, day 115 of this particular site, this was the largest of the uh, patients, the seven subjects that actually experience nodules. So what we see is that physicians also are going to report adverse events over 12 months. And there's a difference in what physician sees, being a clinical investigator, and I can attest to this, a lot of the patients can over-report everything because we want them to report any and everything following the injections of radius in the hands. And so when physicians look at the patients, they can look at certain issues that we know that could or may not be related to the radius injection. And therefore, we see that as far as a severe event, there weren't many patients who had severe adverse events. So in summary, it has been proven to be safe and effective. So radius for hands has been cleared. The FDA has gone through a long process in looking at this and that the AEs were expected and common to all dermal fillers. And they're typically mild to moderate in their severity and that they tend to resolve without any intervention. The efficacy is that the FDA is looking for, did it meet its primary endpoint? Yes, it did. And 75% achieved greater than a one-point improvement in that hand, the MERS hands grading scale in both hands at three months. And then looking at significantly better than the control, that's why the control group got to enter the trial at the three-month mark, and then there was a 98% improvement in the hand appearance at three months. So in conclusion, the treatment with calcium hydroxyl apatite or radius results in significant improvement in the appearance of the hands with an established patient safety profile. 
So those were the studies. Now let's look at some of the pictures before and after of the subjects that were in the studies. This is a 49-year-old Caucasian with skin type 4 who had 3.52, and remember that this allows for the volume of the lidocaine that's in there. That's why it's slightly over 3 cc's. You see the left hand and the right hand before. Her MERS hand grading scale was a three-point improvement, and the patient thought they were very uh, much improved. So you can see the patient at baseline and three months after the injection. Here's another 50-year-old Caucasian female with a Fitzpatrick skin type 2. She had 2.6 cc's. Again, that includes the lidocaine in the left and 2.6 cc's of radius on the right hand. She had also a two-point improvement at three months. This is a 79-year-old, I think this was the oldest patient amongst all the subjects in the, in the six investigation sites of the, of the product in where it was an African-American female, Fitzpatrick skin type 6, and she received 2.3 cc's in the left and 3.0 cc's on the right side. She had a one-point improvement on her MERS hand grading scale at three months. So here's some real patient results using one syringe per hand. So that's one cc. This is Leanne, 47. She was rated a number grade three on the MERS hand grading scale. And this is her photo before, as you can see. These are prominent tendons in the hands and prominent veins. And then we have here after, again, one syringe in each hand. And these results can vary. People respond in different ways, and so the volume, again, can vary. Here's another real patient, Andrea, at 42. She was graded a 2. And again, remember, we didn't add these patients. They weren't qualified to enter the study. So in your general clinical practice, you're going to get patients of all those severities on that MERS hand grading scale. And it's not that you can't treat those, except for they were looking for efficacy, and therefore that's why only grade three, uh, two and three were added. So a grade two, they could enter the, enter the study, but again, they are less severe than a three. And here is a patient I'm sorry. Here is the patient after one syringe per hand. Here's Zandra, 46-year-old African-American. She was considered a grade two, and she had one syringe per hand. Here's Kate at 49. And this is her afterwards. I was just at a conference, and I got a chance to meet Zandra and Kate. And truly, this is representative of what their hands look like now. So let's look at the injection techniques and best practices. So when you take a photo, and I suggest everyone get a before and after photo on your patient. It helps you, it helps the patient remember what it looked like, just in case they feel they didn't have any improvement. But you want to have consistency within the type of photo you, you take. So have the patients place their hands on the table, not on a wall or anything like that, because you drain the blood out of the veins. So you really want the hands in a horizontal position. And the camera should be directly above the hands so that you can incorporate both of the hands into the picture. Have the thumbs apart, although you know some people will 
touch the thumbs together so there's a consistency again in the subsequent photos. But with the study, they had their hands or their thumbs were 1.5 um, inches apart. So with prepping the patient, make sure they take off all their jewelry. They're going to need to anyway because there's significant swelling with this procedure. Have them wash their hands and then on top of that, you want to use an antiseptic for each hand. I typically use Hippocleans, so that is um, keeping the area more sterile or clean than, uh, remember, patients have their hands everywhere. They have to go to the bathroom, so it's very important that we clean the skin very well. You want to mark um, your treatment sites, and so, again, looking at uh, where your tendons are, where your veins are, are traversing the back of the hand, and you may need um, also items needed for the hands are similar to those that we use in the filler in the face. So here's a video. I don't know if I can start it, Jamie, on my end. Okay. Are you starting it? Yep. Okay. Yep. So this is injection technique by Dr. Mitchell Goldman. I'm with my patient Sandy. Sandy has noticed a loss in her volume of her hands, as well as a more prominence of the tendons and a thinning of the skin. And so what we're going to do today is use radius to replace that lost volume of her hands. When you look at Sandy's hands, she has a lot of dermal atrophy. And even though you can't really see a lot of the veins, you do see the prominence of the tendons. And you notice that the skin is very, very thin. She would actually be a grade three on the MERS hand grading scale. It's important to inject between the first and the fifth metacarpal. I like to do my injections actually between the second and fourth metacarpals with the majority of the injection being placed where you have the most prominent defect. The items you will need for this procedure are the same as what you would use for a typical facial filler treatment. I will be using a 27 gauge needle and mixing radius with a 0.26 cc's of lidocaine. We're now going to treat Sandy's hands, and I actually like to do the treatment with her hands on her lap. So we're going to use an absorbent towel of sorts and place it on the lap and just use her lap as a platform. Before the treatment, I've asked Sandy to remove all of her jewelry and wash her hands really well. We then use some alcohol in order to provide additional antisepsis to the hands. We're now mixing 0.26 cc's of lidocaine with our 1.5 cc's of radius. We then attach our 27 gauge needle and then begin the injection. So we're going to be tenting the skin and inserting between 0.2 and 0.5 cc's of radius in this sub-areolar space. We're going to do this in at least four locations, being careful not to inject into the vascular structures. We'll now have the patient make a fist and we'll again gently massage the product causing even distribution throughout that entire dermal space. Making sure it's nice and evenly distributed. Now sometimes using a nice lubricant is helpful to allow for nice, easy, gentle massage. So you can see we've injected in four locations 
we massage the product for an even distribution, but there'll be a continued stimulation of collagen production over the next few weeks or months. Immediately after injection, I recommend that you apply ice to the hands. I think there's a delay on my side of the video and the voice. There, there is a delay. Let's, um, if we can, let's move forward in the essence of time because the delay, unfortunately, is on my side as well. Okay. So everyone could hear the narrative. And again, in the training, <clears throat> this will all be reviewed um, in detail. So let's go to the next slide then. All right, so best practices. <clears throat> you want to isolate the area treatment, tending the skin with your thumb and forefinger. You advance the needle into that plane and it's between the subcutaneous layer and the superficial fascia. And again, this, the nodules that we saw that seem to occur in one of the sites in the, cl the clinical trials um, could have been uh, deeper injections in why the, the nodules occurred in, in a lot of the patients at that site. And we feel that uh, when you look anatomically at the hand, the superficial fascia is uh, definitely can entrap the, the calcium hydroxyl appetite. So it's very important that you stay within the planes that we specify here in order to inject safely in between the subcutaneous layer and the fascia. You also want to inject with the hand more flat. Um, it makes it easier in tenting, and the initial treatment may require one syringe per hand. If a patient experiences a lot of swelling, you, you may want to consider doing less than the maximum amount at one setting, and again, may have to come in several times to reach their optimal correction. So anatomically, when you look at the, this illustration of the injections, again, 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 injections per site. In this specific diagram, you see that before you get to your fingers, in the area of the metacarpal joint spaces, and to the wrist area, that is your location of injection in between those anatomical sites. Um, this particular diagram showed just four injection sites and then the area was massaged. This is pretty much the clinical trial um, information, but it's something that um, is, is maybe good for a novice or initial injector to have some type of guidance in order to know where to inject with this. Uh, product. The massage is very important. That helps to minimize the nodules. Again, gentle massage because we don't want to bruise a patient further if you inadvertently hit a blood vessel. And um, there, like Dr. Goldman used a little lubricant or ultrasound gel. Um, you can really pretty much use a lotion or anything of that nature. So you slip and slide over the dorsum of the hand more easily than a dry hand. So patient recommendations is ice for 24 hours post-treatment. One thing I like to do is we, in our office we have some ice packs and 
I get some gloves and cut the fingers off and put have the gloves put on. I, if they're a size small glove, I give them a medium glove, and they're able to put the glove on, put the ice pack under the glove, and walk out and be able to use their fingers. No strenuous exercise for 24 hours. Their hands can be elevated. Pain seems to um, resolve a little bit if, if a person keeps their hand more elevated. And uh, the refer the patient to the information guide, uh, get the consent form, and let them know what is the potential side effects and, and risk because patients will think that this swelling is abnormal, but if they're, if they're informed that this is a, a, one of the top um, adverse events, then the patient usually expects those things to happen and aren't as alarmed as if they have no knowledge that this reaction is going to happen. So lastly, how do we incorporate the treatment of radius for the hands in your practice? One, it's very quick. It's a 10-minute procedure that fits, I think, in everyone's existing workflow. This is a type of procedure you can see in between patients. You don't have to have a certain amount of time that's delegated to do these types of procedures. If your staff is well-trained and informed, these procedures can be done um, very quickly, again, in, in roughly 10 minutes. So what we want to also emphasize is that it allows you to broaden your line of injectable services. In fact, I think a lot of patients um, don't even think about their hands. So again, it's, it's noting these things and bringing them up to the patient that there is something that we can uh, treat you with to enhance your hands. A lot of your existing patients don't even realize now that this is available. So you can create additional revenue stream for your practice by just mentioning, one, starting out with your patients who use radius in the faces, that do you know that we now have FDA clearance to use radius in the hands and the, the nice effect that you have experienced in your, in your face can also um, treat the hands. So lastly, closing remarks. So radius is the only FDA-approved dermal filler to treat and correct volume loss in aging hands. It's immediate. Patients leave out with um, definitely improvement of their hands. Again, some of it can be swelling, but after about two to three weeks, a lot of that swelling goes down. The patient can really appreciate the improvement of the hands in restoring a lost volume. The next step in your patient aesthetic regimen is recommending hands, like we use a lot of these fillers in the face, but we kind of neglected the hands because we didn't have anything um, that was approved in order to use and enhance the hands. So this is a new addition of a procedure to your practice that you will find that will be um, safe and, and efficient and doesn't take a lot of the time out of your day to perform these procedures. So are there any questions or Jamie, are you gonna go to the last slide? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna jump to the last slide. Um, Anybody who has questions for Dr. Burgess or myself, uh, as I mentioned before, there is a quick survey that pops up and there's a, a question in there where you can actually type in uh, questions for myself or Dr. Burgess. And um, we're going to get right to the end here. This final slide I've, I've added in, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, I'm a certified injector of radius for hands. There are two steps that you must complete. Uh, the first step is you have to log on to the website, which is the radiushandcertification.com, and you can get this online training. It takes about an hour, and you're going to learn uh, all of the pieces of the hand anatomy, product information, and, and injection techniques so that you can incorporate that into your practice. Um, and then once you've completed that one-hour training, you'll actually have a, uh, an appointment with a MERS aesthetic sales representative or a clinical educator from MERS. And to take advantage of this, if you have questions, like I said, please email me directly. These are the two steps. I can certainly send you this information. 
Um, but with that said, I want to thank you, Dr. Burgess, for joining us today. You covered tons of great information, and we really appreciate your time. And thank you to all of our attendees who, who came today to learn a little bit about MERS for hand, or excuse me, Radius for Hands. I, I thank you for staying with us, and uh, have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you again. And thank you for uh, listening to the webinar.